Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition for Food for Thought. My name is Pastor Clint Lang from Hillside Community Church in 100 Mile House, BC, Canada. Glad you could join me for this morning's devotions. We're continuing our series on the parables of Jesus. And this morning we come to a parable called the Parable of the Ten Virgins. And it's found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 14. So if you have Bibles, if you'd like to turn with me to that uh, portion of Scripture, I'll be reading from the New International Version. Jesus uh, tells this parable, and he says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamp but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later on, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So, when we look at this particular passage of scripture and what Jesus was saying, history tells us that in the ancient times, this is good for us to look at as a backdrop to this, it's important for us to understand it. In the time of Jesus, there were, were three stages to the Jewish wedding. Now, the first stage was the engagement, which is the formal agreement made by the fathers, between the fathers. The second was betrothal, and that was a ceremony uh, that was done where there were mutual promises uh, that were made between the bride and the groom-to-be. And the third was the marriage. Approximately one year later, when the groom, he came purposefully, ceremonially, at an unexpected time for his bride. The seasons of the wedding would have uh, been made known, but the bridesmaids in the wedding party who were attending would not know the exact day of the hour. So they need to be patient and anticipating for the arrival of the groom. Now, they didn't have a time frame like we do today, so there would be an approximate time where they could see that the bridegroom was coming, and they would need to be prepared. So traditionally, uh, there were 10 lamps in a bridal procession in the Jewish wedding, which means the bridal party of attending bridesmaids was 10. This was a common-sized wedding party, and we have to remember the ancient traditions of the Jews were, were much more uh, were much different than our present circumstances and our present ceremonies. This is important to understand when viewing the meaning of this parable. So when the groom came unexpectedly, the ten bridesmaids, who in the parable are referred to as virgins, and, and the point of this is not that these girls were virgins or their virginity. Um, the point, that's just simply assumed. But um, the point is that they were young ladies that were uh, attending to the bride. So when the groom came, the bridesmaids would meet the groom out as they approached. There would be a watchman and they would, they would rush out to meet him and usher him and his, and, his, uh, and his party into the wedding hall where there would be a great banquet and uh, to the betrothed. And then uh, the wedding would take place and the banquet feast would be held. Well, it's interesting to note in the Old Testament that God is referring to himself as a bridegroom. Jesus is referring to himself as a bridegroom. And in the Old Testament, God uh, often speaks of Israel in different places in the scriptures as his bride. Now, in this parable, Jesus is making inference to himself as being the groom and his church as being the, the bride. And amongst those who were invited to be part of the wedding supper of the lamb, the, the wedding party, you might say, you know, there's a lot of symbolic language being used here. Five of the bridesmaids, we're told, were foolish, and five were wise, half and half. Well, the groom was delayed in his coming, and, and all the bridesmaids were sleeping, without exception. Um, both the foolish ones and the wise ones were all sleeping, and, and the groom came 
when they least expected it, he came suddenly, and the herald called out, announcing his coming. Well, there were five foolish bridesmaids who didn't have oil in their lamps, enough oil in their lamps to, to light them and greet the groom. And the lamps speak of profession of faith, and the oil represents uh, a type of the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the Holy Spirit is often referred to as oil in the scriptures. The, the wise bridesmaid had oil in containers that they carried with them. The foolish bridesmaid maids had lamps. They, they had a profession of faith. They proposed to have a hope for the coming of their Savior, um, the bride's, bridegroom when he came, but had never really converted. They, they were just Christians on, on, on the tongue, but they'd never really surrendered their spirit um, to the Savior. And as such, they were not, uh, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And, and the groom came suddenly, and the foolish bridesmaids were unprepared. And they asked the wise bridesmaid for oil, but they were sent out to buy some in the marketplace. And th this might seem like a selfish thing, but at that point, um, the wise bridesmaids only had enough oil for themselves. And what this is saying is, that um, the point is that in the spiritual realm, no one can dispense the Holy Spirit to another person. And the Holy Spirit cannot be um, purchased out on the street. There's no one, there was nowhere to, to purchase the Holy Spirit. You have to go about it the right way, and that is surrendering your life to Christ and being filled with the Spirit um, ahead of the coming of the Lord. Um, but these foolish bridesmaids were not prepared. So the foolish bridesmaid, they, they, the bridesmaids rushed out to try and find oil for their lamps before the groom arrived, but none could be purchased. And sadly, while they were out looking to find oil for their lamps, the groom arrived and the doors to the hall were shut, where the wedding supper of the lamb would take place. They called out to the groom to have him let them into the banquet hall, but he said, Truly, I tell you, I don't know you. You see, these foolish bridesmaids, they made professions that they were Christians. They made f professions that they knew Christ, but they didn't. The bridegroom did not know them. They, were not, they, they did not have the Holy Spirit and um, the light of the Holy Spirit. They, they were refused entry into the hall. And, and this parable is a warning to future professing church members not everyone that participates in church services is part of the true church, is part of the wedding party that will be welcomed into the kingdom of God and will be participating with the marriage supper of the Lamb. A person is only a true believer when they have surrendered to God inside and are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's presence it is almost always depicted as being like oil. I, I mentioned this earlier, but oil, what does it do? It provides light, first and foremost, right, when, and it's, when it's in the lamp. It also heats, it's, it warms, um, but it, its primary purpose in the lamp is to produce light. According to the scriptures, no one can be a true Christian without that indwelling Holy Spirit. And, and Romans 8 9 says this, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. According to the Enduring Word Bible Commentary, in, in this parable, Jesus probably did not intend a separation between Spirit-filled and non-Spirit-filled Christians, as the distinction is likely um, between true Christians who have uh, the Holy Spirit in them and false believers. That's what he's trying to say. So I know there's that discussion about about, about that issue, but what they're referring to is the presence of the Holy Spirit. When you become a believer, Jesus' blood is applied to your life. The sacrificial work of Christ is applied to you. You're cleansed. God cleans you and makes you justified just as if you'd never sinned. And then he does that so that his dwelling place can be made in you. And when you're a true believer and you truly confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, his blood is applied to the doorposts of your life. You're the inside of you is clean. Your sins are atoned for. 
You're justified just as if you never sinned. And then that makes a place that's clean for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within you. So this is distinct, a distinction between true Christians and false believers. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 8 to 23, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then by your fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So to become a true believer in Christ, it's not a matter of just uh, a verbal confession. It has to be a heart confession. It has to be a surrender and a repentance and a willingness to allow God to reign within us and to have his way within us. And that is when the Holy Spirit fills a confessing believer who truly believes. Scriptures say it. Jesus says it very clearly. If you love me, you will obey me. Obedience is part of the equation. It shows a heart change. We don't earn our way to salvation. We don't earn a right to sit at the table of the wedding supper of the Lamb. No, but we, but we confess with our mouth. And when we truly believe, our hearts are clean. The Holy Spirit comes in and our lamps are filled with oil and we're prepared for the coming of the bridegroom. There's lots to this parable. I know we could go on even more with this, but I just wanted to touch on these points this morning. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. This is Food for Thought.